Welcome to the Beyond Jiu Jitsu podcast, episode number 58. 58. In this episode. Don't call me great and powerful, Kieran. I'm not going to call you great and powerful. I am Kieran Lefebvre. And, weak. and I'm, I'm joined <laughs> here with the feeble and uh, w- womanly. <laughs> that's not even like. Womanly, the nah, feeble. The feeble and. and uh, frail. Yeah. Anyway, I'm here with Adam. <laughs> Adam's a black belt. Uh, yeah, that's Adam's. That's me. Thing. Hi, everybody. <laughs> this, is, this, is, uh, this is the worst intro we've done in a while. Uh, episode number 58. So today we're talking about how to deal with competition nerves. If you get nervous before a competition, this is the episode specifically for you, your listening pleasure. If you are the physical conjugation of a nervous poo, this episode's for you. <laughs> And if you get nervous taking a poo. <laughs> well, then uh, consult with your doctor. I, yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how to deal with that. <laughs> I don't know why you would be getting nervous, but that seems like a problem to have. Oh, God. But uh, yeah, I, my name's Kieran. I'm a blue belt under Adam. Adam's black belt over there. Let's talk about poo. Let's talk about some poo. So competition. The reason that we are covering this topic is because I am competing on Saturday this week. So we are recording this on a Tuesday because Wednesday's a public holiday. Normally we record on Wednesdays. That's a bit of a behind the curtain sort of information there. So this coming Saturday, I'm competing for the first time in months. And you haven't pooped. And I haven't pooped in a, <laughs> in a week. So we're, we're here to talk about how to, no. Um, uh, stop talking about poop. Yeah. <laughs> the mind of a four-year-old. Okay, so I'm competing this Saturday. So we wanted to cover how to deal with competition nerves uh, because, you know, I'm going through that right now and um, we're going to talk about it. So I've got, got a few points, but- uh, Well, first off, do you get nervous? Yeah, oh yeah. How, how would you- I get really nervous. How would you compare your first competition nerves to now? That's a very good question. I think my second competition nerves were the worst. Really? Yes, because I had expectations. Of my what? first, well, of of doing well, because my first competition, I got um, gold and silver. So, and going into the first comp, I didn't know what to expect. I was fucking nervous. I was really nervous. And I'm gonna talk about that experience because it, it just went to shit. Like the actual coordination and preparation for it was terrible, and I learned so much. Like I, I literally made a list of like 30 things I'll, I'll do different after it. It was, it was nuts. Um, but we can talk about that. I don't Number think I've spoken one, about it on the show before. Change gyms. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it, like I did way better than I expected. Yeah, it was a small local comp. Uh, my But my first ever competition, I think I was like a two-stripe white belt. So I'd been training for two months, I think, at that point. Mm. Um, so not too much experience. I had one move, Americana, under, nice. under me. that And that's it. And that's what I hit for like the From whole comp. bottom. Everywhere, so I could jog. <laughs> <laughs> no, from Mount Bottom. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I think a lot of people go into their first competition expecting, like, oh, I'm just going to get tapped in 30 seconds. Yeah, that's what I expected. I'm like, fuck it, it's my first comp. And you even said that, like, but I'm a very competitive person. But you were like, oh, you know, don't worry, we still love you either way. You know, you pat me on the head, off, off I go. Um, but I'll, t- I'll say, I'll say whatever people who are paying me money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> love no. you daddy yeah. um, but yeah so I had I mean I wanted to do well but I didn't really have I didn't really think I would you know what I mean I yeah. wanted to and I was nervous about that and I had a lot of pressure on myself but I really didn't it was okay as well in my mind if I got tapped in 30 seconds because it's my first comp but I'm fucking winning it right and coming second so I did well and the second one I knew what to expect I knew that it was way fucking harder than I thought it would be like way harder way harder I thought I was a fit guy, but man, the, the level of tiredness you get for those that haven't competed, I cannot understate unless you just go out there and don't really give a shit and whatever it's, it's like a roll. But if you go out there and compete how the other person is competing or in, in, compete how you're intended to with everything you've got, the level of fatigue, the, the, the pain in your, your grip strength is, is stripped. And then you have to back it up another three or four times, depending on how well you do. Mm. And then the next division after that, Nogi, and then absolute after that, or like sometimes in between, which it was for my first comp, but it is immense. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy. Once the adrenaline dump is worn off, it's nuts. So I did not expect it. 
I didn't yeah. I didn't see it coming. Yeah. I didn't see it coming at all. I thought it was gonna be tired, but man, I didn't see it coming. So the second one, I was a lot more nervous, knowing how fatigued I was gonna yeah, be. A, you know, it's actually like a a good <laughs> I've never really thought about that, the second one being worse. You know, uh, yeah, because you you're still not experienced. Because you don't enough. really know what to expect. It'd be kind of like if, you know, if you ate, let's say, uh, you know, whatever level of chili is yeah, super like hot for you, like you eat a habanero or, or a ghost pepper or yeah, something, yeah. and you don't really know much about it. You know, it's hot, and you eat it, and like it's hell. And then you go to do it a second time yep. and you're like, well, I know it won't kill me because I did it last time. But you're also like, I also know how bad this is. Exactly. You know, exactly. And- it's kind of like if you'd never run a marathon before, right? And you're like, oh, you know, how hard can it be really? I'll just give it a go. And then you realize how fucking terrible and how much pain you're in and like how horrible it was. And then like two months later, you, you are going to run another marathon. Yeah. Like you, you know the pain that you're about to go yeah, through. Yeah, it's like it's like a lot of like strength and conditioning work. You yeah, will, you get through the workout, so you know you're capable of it, and you go to do that workout at a at a time in the future, and you know you're capable of it because you've done it before. But you're also like, fuck, you know how much I it sucks. know how much this hurts. Yeah, but in saying that, like competition is fucking epic. I've had I I have had uh, matches where it did last a minute, and I wasn't fatigued after it. You know, because I just got an early tap or whatever. It was it was sweet, right? So it doesn't always have to be like the slugfest war, but just prepare for that. So I'd say for my second one, I was more nervous. But even when I don't have a comp scheduled and I think about competing, I get nervous. Yeah, I'll, I'll just be like, you know, riding home from from the gym or whatever, and I'll just think about competing again or, or whatever it is, and I'll get butterflies in my stomach. You like get to your house and you just keep going. Yeah. <laughs> 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 just drive off into the sunset. I ain't coming back. Can't handle it. But yeah, man, it, it fucking consumes me. Like I can't keep it out of my mind. So I have dealt well, with it. So I've come up with some strategies for it. Well, let me, let's, let's first, I will, you know, the, the episode isn't based off how to deal with your first competition, but let's just quickly, I'm just going to give you a yeah. quick little bit of advice, help, try change the way you think about it so for anyone who is signing up for their first competition this is what i tell my students really honestly you don't have to care i know you do care but what i mean is you don't have to care about the result the res- when it's your first competition and it, your first x amount of competitions for that matter the result is irrelevant uh, if you're signing up for your first competition, I know you want to do well. You wouldn't sign up for the competition if you didn't have, you know, a little bit of competitiveness in you. But there is so much more around the entire experience that you're going to learn and there's so much more to be gained outside of the result. So even if you go in and get tapped in five seconds, right, you still learnt some of the logistics of it. So like the process of depending on where you are in the world and what the competition is, but doing your membership and then going on to smooth comp or whatever website is used to do your registration, choosing your weight division, making weight, uh, you know, uh, turning up to the competition, the atmosphere in the, in the, in the stadium or wherever it is, the, uh, the atmosphere, the weighing in, the standing in the bullpen, the standing next to the mats, waiting for the ref to call you on. Like there is so much more experience to be gained and learned outside of the result. At some point you'll pass a threshold. For some people it might be their second competition. For some people it's their first. Samir is a good example who's a brown belt in judo and has spent years doing all that stuff that I just talked about, but for judo. So he already went in very sort of like, well, the result matters a bit more, right? But everyone's going to have a certain threshold where you'll get to a point where the result starts to matter way more because there's, I mean, there's always sort of value in the experience, but you'll obviously get to a point where, you know, it's rather routine to make weight or standing in the bullpen is very normal nowadays. It's not this foreign experience for you, Mm. right? So if you are going into your first comp, Honestly, you've really got to try take the weight of the result off your mind. Yeah, if you get tapped in 10 seconds, it doesn't matter, man. You had this whole process of, of, of learning and, and of feeling and nervous poops. 
(laughs) so much more for your first competition. Right. And that's what I tell all my students, you know, that even, even if they go get tapped in 10 seconds, I'll be proud of them and that they learned a lot just from that, you know, and yeah, some people, the threshold of when the result matters more will be the second comp, third comp, 10th comp, 20th comp, whatever it is. Right. Totally agree. And I think now that I'm competing the first time for 2022 and the first time at blue belt, I have first comp mentality now, but I have it with all the experience of competing so many times. In That's the past. a good point as well, because I've got some students who, you know, tell me that they will compete at blue belt. They're not necessarily competitors, right? Yeah. Like, Oh yeah, we'll compete at blue belt at some stage. But they're like, I just don't want to do it when I'm a fresh blue belt. I'm like, no, man, that's the best time to do it. Absolutely, You wait till you're a four-stripe white belt. Even no one will put pressure on you, but you, by default, put a bit of pressure on yourself. Exactly, because you're up for your blue. So you're like in your mind. Oh, sorry, you're up for your purple. So in your mind, you're like, I I should be winning because I I, I believe I'm a purple belt. Therefore, I need to beat the blue belts. It's the opposite way of doing it. It's funny. You've just reminded me that we have for the gym – for, for, for our gym, we have a WhatsApp group, right, with all the members. And in Australia, hopefully there's no more lockdowns, mm. right? I mean, who, who can say? But hopefully there's not. Hopefully this year we're back to some level of normality in terms of competitions. You know, today, not by the time you guys are listening to this, but um, as of today we're recording, it's exactly – two years since the first COVID case was in Australia. Wow. So, and during the last two years, it's a bit different where you've been in the country because different states have dealt with it differently. But in New South Wales, the state we live in, in the last two years, there's been, man, you could almost count on one hand the amount of competitions there's been, right? Yeah, yeah. Like almost none, Mm. right? So hopefully this year, lockdowns are over and we're back to some level of normality in terms of competitions. You're doing one this weekend. And then one in March. Yeah. One of our other students, Sophia, she's also doing one this weekend, but a different competition. So there's, you know, two Sydney competitions on, on the same weekend. So it's getting back to normal. Mm. We've got on March 20th, the Sydney cup, Mm. which is, you know, one of the more well-known local Sydney competitions, you could say. We have ADCC and trials. ADCC in March as well. trials as I think well. Six March six, but it's funny because um, you, you kind of just reminded me that I've got to send a message in our group's WhatsApp chat. Um, because you were saying, oh, you know, you then you're up for your purple, so mm. you create this expectation. I'm literally about to send a message saying, like, hey guys, competition March twentieth. After the competition, there'll be a grading. Do whatever you want with that information. (laughs) Everyone's going to go. This is epic. So for comps, um, just a quick aside, then we'll get into some strategies on how to deal with your nerves. For for comps that I go to, for those that watch the YouTube version of this podcast, you'll know, but I put all my comps on YouTube and like a commentary on them most of the time and just like, you know, just put them up there as a bit of a a thing that I do. If we get enough people. It's kind of my thing. It's kind of my thing. If we get enough people, I will bring in a team of videographers to film us. Like I was trying to do that for well, New I'm South not Wales doing State. The competition. I don't care. Oh, well, you said us. I was like, you can film me standing there. No, not no. Us is in the the alliance team. Mate. I'm I'm not gonna film. Oh, I'm not gonna I was waste like, good I was footage like, on you, yeah, bro. I was like, what are you're you filming? Competing. Us, like, uh, yeah. You're, you're not gonna win. Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> you can film me yelling. I typically lose my voice in the first fight. So yeah, in the first fight. Yeah. That's funny. And usually it's just garbage. Like yeah. you, you're you're still standing, and I'm like, Karen. Hip escape. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? No, I do. I always, the last competition. Oh that, my you, God. The amount, of, the amount of people we had fighting at the same. I remember at one point, I think I had four students. At the same time. All at the same time. Yeah. I was like, oh, oh. Yeah, for one of my fights. Who do I ye- like the most? You were yelling out advice. <laughs> no. Like you were standing at my, at my mat, like in between two mats. Anthony was competing next to me, a blue belt. I was a white belt. And you were yelling advice for Anthony and then you chopped to me and I was like trying to listen to you, but I was like, fuck, I can't, I can't listen to uh-huh. And then I think there was at the one point, time. then there was someone on the other side. I think it was even Albert. And then uh, I'm trying yeah. to scream across to Albert. Yeah. And I mean, probably not. I probably should have just picked. I mean, I could, I mean, I'm kind of a bit like, um, what's his name? 
Magnus Carlsen or whatever his name oh, is. Oh, yeah, yeah, the Magnus chess guy. Carlson, yeah. You know, play, I can coach multiple people at once, but, yeah. you know, realistically I would probably had the other people's coaches next to me being like, dude, shut the fuck up. Yeah. Like you're just yelling over there. Yeah. There's a fight <laughs> going on right here. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. So – that, that's interesting. But I, I will, in my personal experience, if you are competing and you're lucky enough to have your coach there or someone who you trust that is coaching you and is giving good advice, um, listening and trying your best to implement that advice will do wonders for you. Absolute wonders. Because it's very, very easy to hear the advice and then ignore it and be like, well, no, that's not going to work or rah, rah, rah. But if you just do whatever you can to implement what they're saying, nine times out of 10, made up statistic, but it will probably work for you. You know what I mean? Because your coach sees things that you can't see because they're removed from the role and also they have more experience. So they understand what is happening. So yep. if you just es- listen and try to implement, it helps so much. Especially if you're a beginner. Like when, you, oh, yeah. when you're a beginner, you forget super basic stuff. Like, man, break that collar grip or, or you know, breathe. Yeah. Right? Like breathing is a big thing. Mm-hmm. You know, people, beginners can have problems with, with breathing just at training in the gym when they're new to mm. jujitsu. Yeah. You see that beginners gas themselves because they're holding their breath. I mean, that's just an exercise thing yeah. uh, in lifting as well, right? Like depending on the lift. You got to brace. You're, yeah, you're, yeah you got to like, you got to brace and inhale and exhale at certain times, right? Yeah. Like it's part of the, yeah. the the exercise. Just to just to give a real world example of where this is going to help you is my first comp in, in one of my Nogi matches. I think it was the semifinals. I, I had I was attacking this guy's turtle and I, I was trying to go for some sort of like anaconda or something and then JT uh, another black belt was was there on the sidelines and it was during the height of COVID so there was fucking no one there right mm. only competitors and coaches could be there which was great because you could hear everything and he he just yells ditch that swing to the back swing to the back and I did and instantly got the renegade choke like that's a real world example of listening trusting and implementing worked out yeah maybe yeah. it won't but fuck if you, you don't have anything else to lose so yeah. listening to coaching is really important and i'm not going to name any yeah, names because it's, it goes both ways right like sometimes you're fighting and you hear your opponent's coach be like watch out he's setting up a triangle and yep. you're like dude shut up exactly you know? <laughs> exactly that, that also that happened in my finals where the the uh competitor my opponent's coach was yelling out how to break my close guard so i knew what technique he was going to use so I just like knuckled down for well, it. Well, yeah, sorry. Yeah, then there's even the I other used it flip against, side. Yeah, yeah, I used it against him. Yeah. Like I, he was, I know he was going for that. I, f- I forget what it's called, but it's like the knee on the butt uh, break, like a, a commando oh, or something Oh, yeah, like, like the that. knee through the middle. Yeah, knee through the middle. I knew he was trying to do that. So I, I didn't let him get the the space to get his knee in. Yeah. Um, it was still uncomfortable, but I was able to hold my, my clothes you, you were like, I've had harder things in my butt. Exactly. It was fine. I've had bigger, <laughs> larger, more... Anyway, let's not forget uh, <laughs> Kieran was in the Navy. Yes, yes. <laughs> so that works as well. And then on the same day, JT was actually there to coach someone from his gym and they didn't listen to a fucking word he said. And they got smoked. They did. Like he was yelling, this is according to JT. And if you don't, you, if you haven't listened to the episode with JT, go back and listen to that. But he's very animated and very passionate. But this person was just ignoring him and he was like, I'm done with that person. <laughs> <laughs> they so they didn't listen to a fucking word. And anyway, um, so good. but- Let's get into some actual strategies on how to deal with nerves. Yeah. And as someone that's competed- so the whole thing that like sports psychologists will talk about and, oh, yeah. you know, so there are strategies. Yes. You know, there's, there's things that, and everything is going to work a little different for other people. Mm. But I mean, yeah, professional athletes hire professional sports psychologists to deal with, to, to deal with this stif- to, stuff. Yeah, so, to deal with performance anxiety. I mean, and, that's neither of us. We are yes. not sports psychologists. But, but for, for someone that's gone through the, the beginning process, the early day process of it in the last uh, 18 months or so, and I'm going through it again, uh, all over again at Blue Belt, there's, there's a lot of things that I've learned and I want to share with you all uh, on how to deal with your first competition or how to deal with competitions in general if you're a beginner, right? Send it. Send it. Okay, so I have a list of things that I wish I knew or to deal with it. Be over-prepared. Don't just be prepared. Be fucking over-prepared. Now, the reason I say be over-prepared is because for my first comp, I was so under-prepared in terms of logistics, I'm talking. Not in a, I'm not even talking about the jujitsu side of house. Ignore that for a second. You can only do what you can do, right? Training more is better. We all understand that. But in terms well, of- Apparently not. There are some people who think training twice a week is the way to go. <laughs> 
That's anyway, a, that's, carry a, that's, on. A, that's a throwback. Um, so yeah, be overprepared. And here's a couple of things that uh, I think that you need to like just jot down and consider if you are competing, if you, even if you have competed before, make a list of everything that you need, right? I'm, I'm a list guy. So this really helps me. Even if you're not a list person, just trust me on this. Like just trust, it will help. Make a fucking list of everything. And the things that you want to have on that list are bring a spare gi. So don't just bring your gi, bring a spare if you have Gotta it. Gotta take two gis. Gotta take two gis. If one rips, you're fucked, right? Mm-hmm. You, same with your rash guard. Take two sets of uh, no gi if you have it and make sure that your your rash guard is ranked. Even if you're like, maybe your competition allows, un, like uh, doesn't have rules on ranked rash guards, make sure that, you have a ranked rash guard. And what I mean by that is IBJJF rule set. The rash guard needs to be 30% of the color of your belt. Mm-hmm. Okay. So make sure it's ranked. Don't fall into that trap. Um, be on weight. Be on weight the week of the comp. If you are, for whatever reason, we can we can have a whole episode on how to cut weight and should you cut weight um, in, a, in a future episode because I think that's a good thing to tackle. So I'm not going to go into that but right now. But if you are cutting weight, make sure that you've done – All you need to do the week of, so you're on weight for the entire week and then just hit maintenance calories. If you need help with that, I do um, diet jujitsu athletes for competition. So hit me up on Instagram and I can sort you out there. Um, Don't scout your opposition. At early, you don't need to. In in my opinion, and maybe maybe you have a different opinion, I'd love to hear it, but I, I think that scouting out your opposition when you're a white belt or blue belt and when, when you're not at Worlds, it's going to do you more harm than good. You're going to be overthinking. You're going to look him up on Instagram. Oh, look at this fucking dude. He's so big. Or one of our, um, one of our students, our students, one of your students, one of our teammates. It would my be teammates. if you started teaching the fucking kids class. <laughs> 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 a guy no, get, no gee Rob had previously said, oh, teach kids. He came in yesterday while I was still teaching kids class. Like, my, I would not teach kids. I don't usually teach the kids anymore. One of our other guys, Aaron does it, but he's away. He's getting married. Congratulations, Aaron. Uh, so I was teaching the kids and Rob walked in and siblings are always the worst. These two siblings going at each other and Rob's just like, nah, fuck I that. take yeah. back my offer. Yeah, fuck that. So yeah, um, one of the guy, a guy that trains at our gym, he was, he was competing and he'd scouted his opposition and even went so far as to look up their Instagrams and was like showing everyone this guy because he was a massive unit. Like, oh, looking out, looking through their window at their house. Yeah, and like with his pants off. No, but he, <laughs> like, I think that that would do way more harm than good. You don't need to, you don't need to look at them. You don't need to see them. This, it was the same. I learned that from bodybuilding where you have a similar system in bodybuilding where you see who's in your bracket before you, you get there on the day. Like you can look up on the, on the software and see who you're competing against. Super easy to get their Instagram because everyone has a public Instagram when you're a bodybuilder to show off. And if you like scope them out, it just fucks with your head. It fucks with your head. You've, you're defeated before you even get there. So do, just don't look at it. You don't need to, not at this point, you're not going to worlds mate. So don't do that. Um, get there early. Like, plan to get there earlier than you than you think. I know that some people like to get there late and like to like literally rock up and go straight out. But in your first few competitions, I highly recommended heck recommend getting there early, acclimatizing to the environment, like learning who you need to talk to, like, you know, going to meeting the the officials that like uh are in charge of your mat, sorting out, you know, where the bullpen is, how to weigh in, all of that shit, do it early. And then I would definitely have a warm up routine prepared in advance. So don't just rock up and you see it all the time in the bullpen. Like people just doing random shit that they'll never actually do in the gym. Have like a set routine, pick like four or five exercises or warm ups that you're going to do and just do them on, on repeat. If you need help with mobility and everything, check out Bulletproof for BJJ or there's so many free resources online. And then I, the last one I would say in preparing is, or being overprepared is, Decide on your first technique. Decide whether you're going to pull guard or whether you're going to go for the takedown. That's it. Don't prepare any more than that. Don't don't like go, oh yeah, if he does that, I'm going to do this. If he does this, I'm going to do that. You don't need a uh, a game plan, if you will, because you don't know what they're good at and what they're bad at. Just choose whether you're going to pull guard or whether you're going to go for the takedown and how you're going to do it. If you're a bit more advanced, maybe an alternative for each and that's it. So that's what I have for being overprepared. I have a couple of like a list of things to pack, but what do you think about that? Yeah, I agree with all that. Uh, 
the first one just talking about logistics and like the reason that being over prepared is important is because it guarantees one one less piece of anxiety and exactly. stress that you need to carry so uh if i have a big competition coming up i often will i have two phones mm-hmm. right the kids are always like where have you got two phones i've got my the gym has a phone and i've got my personal phone right mm-hmm. if i have a big competition i often set an alarm on each phone like i never sleep through my alarm ever but it's almost like just that extra like yep. no i'm just going to set two like you said bringing a second gi right it's that the chance of your gi ripping or your gi not passing inspection depending on you know some people like myself are in between sizes so it yeah. is a real possibility i always take two gis yeah. more for that more for that not if my gi rips but i i could be i could have my gi not pass inspection at any given time because i'm right on the limit of of an a3 being passable you know so it's one less piece of like stress i don't have to worry about because i know if my gear doesn't pass i've got a second one uh you know i go so over prepared that you know the amount of food that i pack to take with me like never get family for a day yeah yeah yeah, Yeah, pretty much like i'm always like i'm always like i don't know 10, 11, 12 bananas, yeah. you, know? <laughs> you know, I take so much yep. food, you know, because the last thing you want is, is to be hungry, you know, and if you're making weight nicely or you often, sometimes you weigh in and then you still got an hour. So yeah. maybe your weight cut was a bit rough and you know, you want to make sure you can rehydrate and eat and something. Yeah. I'm not saying don't pig out before you fight. Well, that's we're talking about nerves, not about mm. how to not nutrition, not nutrition. We're going to cover that in detail later. Right. Um, and yeah, like the just sort of the other two points you mentioned about not scoping your competition and having a technique in mind. Yeah, like in the beginning, not even in the beginning, just even for me as a black belt, some random local competition here in Sydney, right? I'm I'm not competing against a big name or anything. Mm, like it's not a super fight. Yeah, there's no point studying your competition. Like you're just gonna psych yourself out, like exactly. you said. Yeah. And you know, and you can often even psych yourself out as much as like seeing, you know, oh, that dude looks tough, you know, like, you know, he's got that sort of like almost like resting bitch face sort of thing. Doesn't mean he's any good at jujitsu. Yeah. Like the Meow brothers look like dweebs and they'll beat the crap out of you, you know, like, you know, it's not, you'll naturally judge the, judge the book by its cover. And you know, you've just got to do your best to implement your game, right? Maybe, maybe you pull guard and man, like he might be the best guard player in, in your division. Like you don't know, like, yeah. And if that's how the, the, the chips fall, he was better on the day, right? You don't know, but it could also go the other way. Maybe he takes you down and he doesn't realize that you're the best guard player in mm. your division or in, in your country. Or in right? the world. Like, yeah, or in the world. <laughs> Right, you've just got got your game, and that leads me into the next thing where you said like have one technique or whatever. You don't need to, don't yeah, don't think about your opponent. Your opponent is just like a blank canvas almost. Yeah, they're a they're a living grappling dummy. Yeah, like if you could do something from a movie where you have a grappling dummy that comes to life, mm. that's who your opponent is. Right, it doesn't matter who they are. Have have a game plan for to to simplify it i i say have a game plan plan for top and bottom mm-hmm. right so your your ideal game plan might be let's say a very simple one that gets um that is a very simple game plan for white belts for their first competition or oh, try take them down pass mount and submit a very sort of stand which i mean if you could do that at black belt is a great game plan you know but to if you also have a game plan for being on the bottom you know because maybe you get taken down or maybe you decide to pull guard in the moment because it's not going i say you have a you have a top game plan and you have a bottom game plan yeah right obviously the higher up you get you know you then look at you know the the professional level it's you know you don't necessarily have to go that that far Mm. 
You know, it doesn't need to be that far or that simple. But having that game plan for top and bottom is going to help you kind of feel very well prepared mm. without having to to cover everything. Yeah, because you you want to be prepared, but also not overthink it. You don't yes. want to fall into that. What if this? What if that? Yeah, yeah. And you need to be ready to abandon your game plan. Exactly. Like, like I at think a, at I, a whim. I think I've told this this uh, before, where the last the last fight I had was was Subversion years ago now. Like we were saying, there hasn't been competitions for a while. Uh, I think we mentioned on a couple episodes ago, I was supposed to be fighting this up-and-coming subversion, pulled out due to my surgeries. But I haven't fought since the last subversion. And my game plan was um, was actually <laughs> like that white belt game plan, was take down, pass, submit. I have a really nice submission I like to do from mount. I prefer to pass. So, I mean, it made sense. Went for my initial takedown. Uh you know, I just missed the leg and then I kind of felt like just the way I could feel his base and I felt like I'd sort of shown my hand a bit. In that moment, I was like, you know, I feel like this takedown is going to cost me a lot. Mm -hmm. So I bailed on it. I pulled guard, swept him, passed, mounted, submitted. Yep. Right. So Different avenue to so, the same plan. Yeah. So I have a game plan for top and bottom. Yeah. Right. So you – don't what if it, oh, but what if he does this? It doesn't matter what he does. You just have your job, yep. right? Yep. And, and at you the end implement of the day, it's just a your role. job. Like at the end of the day, you were, you were doing jujitsu. You were just rolling, right? I know it's a competition, so yeah, you're going hard, but you know, just like if you approach a role with a, I want to practice this today, and then you end up in a different position, you're still not, you're not going to like doggedly go for that one thing when it's like, you know, you're getting smashed on, on bottom or something like that. Yeah. It just doesn't make sense. So at the end of the day, just do jujitsu. Like you've, you've been training jujitsu, just so have they. You have similar experience. You're the same weight, just do jujitsu, you know? Yeah. Um, so it brings me to my next like big point. And then I want to go through like a, a list of shit to pack is, and we, we sort of or, already sort of mentioned this, but I want to like consolidate it and simplify it in like one sentence is focus on the process, not the outcome. You mentioned already like the outcomes are relevant but you, your brain naturally wants to focus on something, particularly when you have anxiety, you're going into something, you don't want to feel like, you know, you're underprepared or whatever. So focus your attention and all that nervous energy onto the process. And what I mean by process is focus on your warm up, focus on, on the, the preparation, focus on your logistics, focus on your mini game plan, right? And not not to the point where you're like stressing about it. Just just focus on the process, not the outcome. Focus on doing jujitsu. Yep. And that will really, really help. Just keep it almost like if you're really struggling and it's like crippling anxiety and your your nerves are getting the better of you and you're shaking or whatever, just honestly focus your your attention on what you need to do next. As in like now I need to go on the mat. Now I need to uh, engage with a collar. Now I need to sit to guard or, or whatever. Just focus on the fucking process. Yeah, it's kind of like how um, ultra marathon runners, mm. you know, talk about how, what they do when they hit the wall. Mm. And, uh, you know, and just it's one more super, step. Yeah, yeah, super cliche, but just one foot in front of the other. Yep, just right? one more step. Yep. Um, yeah, you – it's kind of in line with what I think is one of the – a really powerful tool to help you – and this is in during the process, right? This is not, I mean, you can do it on the day as well, but if I'm super nervous or if I have a really important competition, this is a process I do from pretty much from the day that I've registered to compete or that I've agreed to take whatever super fight or whatever. I essentially gaslight myself, you know, uh, for anyone who doesn't know what gaslighting means, which I think most people do. It never used to be a word that people use. Yeah, but now it's very a couple common. of years ago. People didn't know what gaslighting meant. It's yeah. really common now. It's essentially a nicer way of of, of brainwashing. <laughs> kind of gaslighting is kind of brainwashing. It's uh, yeah. It's you know. I think the actual definition. Hang on. Is because uh, Google can. Dun dun so, dun dun dun. Yeah, so it yeah, it's loosely defined as making someone question their own reality. Yeah. You know, so like when you gaslight someone, it can be almost convincing someone to like 
if you gaslight someone, you can get them to start doubting their own memory yeah. of like what happened back in high school or something. Like that's gaslighting, right? But anyway, like, yeah, to use it in a more casual way, it's essentially just I gaslight myself in or brainwash myself in terms of positive reinforcement, right? And it's almost like this protective barrier that doesn't allow any negativity in. So what I will do when I have an important fight competition or if I'm, you know, more nervous than usual, I'll actually have notes on my phone and it's kind of the opposite of every negative thought I've ever had. And what I mean by that is, you know, now having more experience competed, I know sort of what some of those what ifs are that creep into my head. So I'll just like have bullet points and I'll read them to myself every day. And it might be like, you know, you're whatever, you're bigger and stronger than your opponent. You know, you're one of the best, you know, blue, purple, brown, black belts in the world. You're the, and they don't, they don't necessarily need to be like factual, but you know, it's, it's that inherent belief in yourself, you know? And I guess that's where, that line is where sometimes people, you know, can come across as like cocky and arrogant, but you know, like it's, their it's actually just confidence. Yeah. Or So when I say like, oh man, this guy doesn't stand a chance. I'm going to tap him in two minutes. Like it's actually not necessarily, I maybe actually don't even believe that deep down, but if I say it enough, I will. Mm. And it might just be me, you know, enforcing belief in myself. I'm not trash talking my opponent. It's more just to positively reinforce myself. Totally. So I'll, you know, so I'll do that. And then on top of that, I'll do heaps of visualization. So every day or any time a bit of negativity comes in, I have my, what I call like my gaslighting list, you know? So, you know, uh, and I'll also just some other stuff that sometimes your coach might tell you, you know, your coach might say to you, man, like you, let's say double legs, maybe you get into this habit of doubting your double leg because you got caught in that guillotine once mm -hmm. or something. So you start questioning whether going for double legs, but your coach might say to you, man, you got to have faith. Like your double leg is you're a blue belt who double legs better than most black belts I've met. Blah, blah. You've got a really good double leg. Like you've got to believe. So that would be on my gaslighting list, you know, like, you know, like have faith in the techniques. Like, you know, you're, you know, you're really this or that or whatever it is. I've actually so, stolen one of those from you that you told me ages ago um, on the podcast. And then I've stolen it and repeat it in my mind all the time when I'm rolling, whenever I get really gassed and I really want to use it on the comp scene because it's the first comp coming up that I've like had this tool because it's kind of mm. like a mental tool is you were explaining that for, I believe it was for uh, worlds or, or I can't remember what competition, maybe it was that pan, uh, Pan Am's at Blue Belt, mm -hmm. and you said you went through the most grueling workouts in preparation for that for yeah. your cardio that you knew. It was for the selectives. For the yeah. selectives. That there was no fucking way your opponent was as fit as you because you knew the work that you put in. Like, so you said in your mind, like, there's no, like, however tired I am, I know that this guy's t more tired. I've been doing that constantly. Yeah. Like, I mean, at that point in time, the belief was so so true to me that's like when I was saying to myself, there's no way it's just I'm more tired than this guy. Yeah. It was like, it was factual. The same yeah. as, you know, saying like, yes, my name is Adam or yeah. like, yes, I have a dog. Yes. You know, like it was so factual. It was like, there's no way, like it yeah. is not possible. And even if, even if, right, it's, it's not, it's not true, but it is true to you. So that's all that matters, right? So I've, I have been known in our gym for having like one of the best gas tanks. And maybe it's not even that I have a really good gas tank. It's that whenever I'm like so fucking tired that I feel like I can't keep going, I just tell myself they're more tired. So I need to go harder. Yeah. You know, I need to punish the fact that I want them to think that they're thinking the same thing as me. But if I then turn it up a notch, they are going to be crushed mentally. Like yeah. I, I would have won the mental battle. Yeah. And that, that's like, I don't know if that really is going to help your nerves as such, um, like that one, but it may help your performance. If, if, you're, if you have that little creeping doubt in your mind when say you are on the competition mat and you are in a losing position and you, in your mind you're like, fuck, I'm going to give up. You need to have something like that to pull out. Like be yeah. like, you know, 
channel some fucking David Goggins and don't let your inner bitch take over and just tell you something like, tell yourself something like, yeah. you know, they, they have to be more tired than me. It's not possible. Yeah. And believe it. So I, yeah, I also add a lot of visualization as well. So uh, I'll, I'll actually close my eyes and visualize, you know, the, for, for me now I have enough experience that making weight and standing in the bullpen, like, you know, yeah, I'll still be like nervous or whatever, but there's no, that's not part of the process for me as about much. It. Like it's automatic. For, yeah. for me, the, yeah. the, if you will, the fight starts, like the point where it becomes like, okay, it's happening is when they call me from the bullpen and walk me out. Right. Yeah. So, I'll, <laughs> so I'll visualize that process. I'll visualize me and my opponent getting called out mm -hmm. and he is just a faceless person, mm -hmm. right? Like it doesn't matter. And I'll visualize getting called out, mm -hmm. getting called out onto the mat, shaking their hand, my fight playing out like my dream fight. For some people, that's a flying triangle. For some people, it's, you know, pull guard, bearing bolo, take the back, whatever it is, right? So I'll visualize it, visualize getting my hand raised, visualize standing up on the podium. So then when I get to the competition, it's almost like this premonition. It's like, oh, I've been here before. I've said, I know how this yeah. plays out, yeah. but it also comes back to just that gaslighting myself and the visualization. It creates this like protective bu barrier bubble for myself because really nerves get out of control when, when the negativity starts coming. What if this happens? Yeah. What if this, oh, you're, you're and not like, good enough. You're, what, you're, yeah, what if I get tapped and my wife leaves me, yeah. you, know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know, all this sort of stuff, my protective bubble and constantly rereading my gaslighting list and doing my visualization, it just makes all those negativity thoughts just like bounce off, you know, like they just, they don't, they don't, they never make it in to infect like, you know, the inside of me. And, you know, that then connects to my next point, which is, I could be wrong here. I'll, you know, I always say I'm not a doctor, but I believe that neurologically what's happening in your brain when you're nervous is the same thing that happens when you're excited. I believe like very, yeah, sim very similar, responses. very similar parts of the brain are yep. firing and, but they're obviously very different emotions for me. When I fought at masters, like a few years ago, I did a really good mental preparation that then it was really the first time for me that my nerves were man, really just like pure excitement. Like I was like chomping at the bit to get out on the mat and compete opposed to like, uh, uh, you know, I've had times yeah. where I've been so nervous where I was in the middle of a match in a good position like mount or side control or something. And I just wanted, I just wanted it to end so I could go home. I was like, I was look at the clock. There's still two minutes left. I was like, I just want this to be over, you know? And then like, I would win the match and I'm like even more nervous because now I've got to fight again. You know, I was like, I just wanted to, even being on side control top, I like wanted to tap you so I could go home, yeah, you know? Yeah. Whereas this That's was, crazy, the, yeah. this was the first time that that protective bubble allowed me to not only deter all this negativity, but it allowed that nervous energy to really become excitement. Yeah. And, and you uh, can, you can also try and gaslight. This is a very common one. And one of my points as well is you can try and gaslight yourself into when you do get nervous and you have that feeling you, and you know, it's nerves. You can say, Oh wait, no, I'm wrong. Like I'm mistaken. That is excitement. You know, yeah. you can treat your nerves, even though it's fucking nerves, it's anxiety. Like you're nervous as fuck, but you can say, no, that's, that's excitement. I'm excited. There's actually another thing that I read and, could very well be wrong because I just read it online. <laughs> but um, but this was at a time when, yeah, I was like reading heaps of things about being nervous and whatever. And apparently it's like when you're nervous, you're never – like you never visibly look as nervous as you feel, right? And apparently knowing that fact, knowing the fact that you don't – look as nervous as you feel yeah. automatically decreases how nervous you feel. That makes sense. Cause a, a big part of nerves, particularly with jujitsu or any competition, but jujitsu competition is for, well, for me anyway, you don't want to look, you don't embarrass yourself, right? You don't want to look bad. Yeah. So yeah, I, that's brilliant. If you know that you don't look nervous when you feel nervous, 
that reduces some of the it, nerves. It essentially, like yeah, it, like it, 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 it helps avoid it snowballing out of control. Yeah, that makes right? sense. Yeah. If you are super nervous, I mean, another great bit of advice is don't wear a white key in case you poop yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, this is something that we used to tell um, our junior officers of the watch when before they were being assessed because people like this sort of shit, it can be career ending. Like I've assessed people where if they fail, they're most likely being kicked out of the Navy because that, right. that's the level of our, like the pressure that, that you're under. Um, so I've, I've like assisted in assessments where someone has been booted from the Navy after failing it or whatever. But so there is a lot of pressure is I'm trying to paint the picture that it's, it is real. Right. But what we used to, what I used to tell them is first of all, it's not real. Like when you're going in a simulation, cause this is this, all this assessment and training is done in a simulation. Like it's, it's self-imposed pressure. The pressure isn't real. It doesn't actually exist. But then you also have the pressure of getting kicked out. So that's obviously real. But what we used to say to them is, is basically channel that anxiety, channel that nervousness into excitement. And if you're not nervous, it means you don't care. So being yeah. nervous, being nervous is a positive thing when you can channel it through excitement. Be like, no, you're not nervous. You're excited. It's it's it, it is quite difficult to do, but if you weren't nervous, I really like the whole, if, if you, if you're not nervous for something, it means you don't care. It means you're probably going to fuck it up. Yeah. Well, they, yeah, that's a real thing as well. They say that a lot that, yeah, you know, nerves are a good thing. If yes. you know, Oh, when will you stop competing? Oh, when I stop getting nervous. Yeah. You know? Uh, yeah. But yeah it's it very, you don't give a fuck. Very Ender's game. Ah, uh, right. Have you read that? Yeah, it's like it's like the only book I've read. Really, I, I love Ender's Game. I don't read many books. That's like, crazy. But, Did um, you read Ender's Shadow as well? No, I didn't even know there was a, a sequel. Read. Yeah, and then I it's watched the, a, and then I watched the movie and I was like, meh. The movie sucked. Yeah, the book is so much more. The book hectic. is awesome. Yeah, there's a great book. But yeah. yeah, science fiction. It's really really great. But was, Ender's Ender's can't Shadow really, can't really like tell what I'm referencing without ruining the book for people. If yeah. you know, you know. If you don't, read the book. It's a great yeah, book. Read the book. Yeah. So just quickly uh, to summarize the episode and to, to cap off the episode, rather, I just had a, a list, a very short list of things that you may not have thought of to pack that this, this pairs with my first ever point, which is to become overprepared and with competing aside from the jujitsu, which you can't change once you're there, right? Like yeah. it's, it's pretty much locked inside. What you know is what you know. So don't worry about what you don't know. This, this sort of shit can help you. Um, what's is, in the bag? What's in the what's bag? In the, what's Dick in, in the box? box? What's in the box? Are we, are we referencing? Yeah, Dick you in were the ref box? you were referencing Dick in the box. I was referencing Seven. Seven. The movie Seven. Don't worry. Come on, man. All if right. I'm putting anything in a box, it's a dick. <laughs> <laughs> dick in a box. Okay. Um, so we've already mentioned a couple of these, but I just want to give you a list so you can save this and come back to it. Things to pack. Definitely a spare gi and spare rash garden shorts. With mm -hmm. that, we've already established that and the reasons why. Next is food. You need to bring more food than you think you need, right? Bring <laughs> enough food for a whole day of eating, right? The food that you want to prioritize is fast, simple carbohydrate. Don't bring like a fucking sweet potato and mung on that. You want things like fruit. You want things like dextrose. You want fast acting carbs. And there's, I'm going to, again, I'm going to do a nutrition video, uh, podcast uh, for competition and, and explain all the reasons why. And you want protein as well. So you want carbs, you want protein, a little bit of fat is okay, but prioritize fast carbs and protein. Next, you want to bring a shitload of electrolytes. Even if you're not like a Gatorade or Powerade person, bring a shitload of Gatorade, bring like fucking three liters of Gatorade. It will help you between matches. It will rehydrate you like nothing else. And the, the added bonus of using Gatorade over just an electrolyte powder is that Gatorade does have simple carbohydrates in it. It's got dextrose in it. So unless you are adding sugar to your electrolytes, go with a Gatorade if you don't have a carb-based electrolyte powder. Next is, this is more relevant if you're in winter, but still do it anyway, is bring like a hoodie or a jacket or whatever to put on between matches to stay warm and like socks yeah. and shit to wear. Because yep. the Espe worst thing- Especially if you- just competing in nogi. Exactly. You can get pretty quiet, yeah. cold once your once yeah. your wet rashy starts. Yeah. <laughs> and the aircon in wherever like the, the environment that you're in, you don't want to have to then try, you don't want to have to use a lot of energy warming up, right? And on the warm-up, just as a quick aside, you should be sweating during your warm-up. 
Don't yeah. warm up. Don't like try and it's a very, very common mistake to not warm up enough to not want to exert yourself, but it's actually the opposite. And this is backed by research. You want to be like sweating a bit. You want to break a sweat yeah. doing your warm up. You don't want to be like fucking just wasting your time and lazing around. Right. Um, warm, it, which just brings me to the next point, warm up gear. So if you normally use a foam roller or a trigger ball or whatever during classes, do the exact same thing. Yep. Make sure you replicate your warm up in the gym. Uh, there at the in the bullpen or wherever you are warming up. Now I did put on headphones. Now I wanted to talk about that. I know a lot of people find it advantageous to block out the world before they they step on, and they even wear them right up until they're getting called onto the mat by the referee, and then they take them off or whatever. I've done both now. Um, I've done no headphones twice and headphones once. I. Don't know if they help me. I think it's the opposite. I think it zones me out. Yeah, I don't like to wear headphones or listen to music before yeah, competing. I like I. to just – the maximum amount of time I can spend in the the ambient atmosphere mm. of the the competition floor, like I find it – like if I'm listening to music and then take them off, going from the sound of that music that's supposed to pump me up mm. to the sound of – the competition stadium, they like it's, so too, it's too jarring. I totally I just, agree. You know, to the point nervous, where like, Le- yeah. Levi and I used to, when we would, when we would train, we never were on the same competition scene because, you know, we're at different stages in our career. Uh, but just when competitions were coming up, we would just have instead of music playing in the gym, just comp- like competition noise, like ambience. ambience yeah, sounds, so wow. it would essentially just be like type into YouTube, like. Stadium, you know, fucking something like that. Uh, Bushesha versus whoever worlds, you know, find a 12 minute match. I right? cool, play that on YouTube and just the sound of like, hey, hey, and then all the yeah. other people in the distance screaming yeah. and just have that ambient noise because that's what you hear when you compete. Yeah, totally uh, agree. But I think some people, some people, plenty of people, far better than you and I at yeah. Jiu Jitsu have headphones. Bushesha, on. he, he yeah. always listens to music right before he's about to step on. He takes them off just as he's stepping yeah. on the mats. Like, there's so many athletes that I don't know what they're playing, maybe nothing, but um, I the only reason I put it on the list is if. If that helps you, try both. I've yeah. tried both. It doesn't help me. So now I know. I'm like you. Yeah. I need to stay in the environment. I need to stay engaged I, uh, and then step on the mats. I went to compete once in Brazil and one of my teammates was like, he was listening to music. Mm. He was like, bro, listen listen to this. This is going to pump you up big time. <laughs> I put on his headphones and it was just like, I come from a land down under. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, fuck like, off. Yeah. Vegemite. Vegemite sandwich. Um, and then a couple other little things that you want to bring like that. Actually, Bulletproof for BJJ did a really good podcast on um, on what's in their gym bag. So I recommend going and listen to that and just bringing everything that they Or recommend. don't and we'll steal it and do yeah, an we'll, episode on it later. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but like bringing things, like making sure you have things in your gym bag, like, you know, your flip-flops or thongs for the Australian listeners, things like a small first aid kit, uh, you know, fucking- Yeah, I ed- was just going to say more specifically like tape. Yeah, tape. Know. Yep, yep. Finger tape, if that's if that's something that you, even if you don't like really use it, use it. Like in case one of your fingers bleeds or whatever or breaks, you know, you need to tape that shit up, bring tape. Um, yeah, there was a couple other things like antibacterial wipes, anything that you normally have with you. And fuck, please don't forget your mouth guard. Just before I was oh, about- Don't to, even wear one, it's fine. No, nah, definitely wear a mouth guard. But just before I was about to step <laughs> on, just before I was about to step on my first um, ever f- like match, in my first comp, I was so late, so nervous, so underprepared. I didn't have enough shit. I had no food. I had no fucking water. Um, I was like racing out. I was like, they're like, oh yeah, you're you're going on now because the the lineup was so long and the coordination of the event was so poor and I nearly missed my fucking match. Anyway, I was I was like frantically running around. I was still wearing my glasses. I had no mouth guard and I was about to step on. And I'm like, oh fuck, you know, and I had no <laughs> shoes either because I didn't bring my thong. So I'm like running around this stadium barefoot. Like it was an absolute fucking shit fight. And so um, I, I ran and got my mouth guard and I was like, my mate was there and I was like trying to get him to fucking get me Gatorade and all this sort of shit. And he like had a fucking broken ankle. So he was like hobbling around. He couldn't fucking move very quickly. Man, it was just an absolute nightmare. So from that experience I've learned, be overprepared, pack all the shit you think you need and then pack extra. The way I think about it now is if one of my teammates was there and they didn't pack anything, would I be able to support, yeah. would I be yeah. able to supply everything to them? If the answer is no, pack more. Yeah. And that's how I operate nowadays. And it just, not that I'm going to fucking have to do that, but if I, if I need to, I can. 
And that's, I want to be the guy that is prepared for everyone. That way I know that I'm prepared for myself. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's my, my piece. Yeah. So I think that's, you know, as a, as a whole, you could put this episode into sort of like two things to help you deal with your, with nerves. And it's about reducing like the, if you had a checklist and each item on that list is something that will add, incrementally add a little bit of stress, anxiety, nerves, yeah. if it's not crossed off, right? So there was two sides of it. There's the the physical sort of tangible logistic side of it, which is what you spoke about a little bit more. So in terms of like what you pack in your bag and things like that, they're all little things that if you tick it off the list is going to, that means that's a point of anxiety, stress, nerves that has been negated. And then I spoke a little bit more about uh, the psychological side of it. And again, it's going to work for different people. There are incredibly high paid professional sports psychologists who work with people of the caliber, like, you know, the Michael Jordans of the world. So exactly, this yeah. is, you know, I'm just talking from my experience, you're going to, everything's going to work a little different for your, for, for each individual. But for me, creating that protective bubble, and I do that through, you know, self gaslighting and uh, visualization, and that helps me convert nervous energy into excitement. I like and I that. think the, the logistical side of thing and having some sort of mental side, those are the two sides of dealing with nerves for competition, in my opinion. The, the, the tangible logistics and how do you deal with the mental side of it. And just as like a, not something to point out the obvious, but I will, the more, you, if, if competing is something that you want to do in jiu-jitsu, the more you compete, the better you'll get at these processes. Like in my first three comps, I've made so many mistakes, but I've learned from those, right? And now moving forward to this first blue belt comp, I'm going to try and implement and correct all the mistakes that I've made previously. The more you do and the more mistakes you make, the better your process will become, the more organized you'll be. And then you can start focusing on what's really important is the actual jujitsu. Yeah. And I'll give you one last little thing for anyone who maybe isn't interested in com the competitive side of jujitsu at all. This is more like answering the question, should I compete? You know, if you're not interested in competition, maybe you got into jujitsu for self-defense. I'm going to put this question forward to you. If you can't handle the stress of a competition environment, if you can't handle the stress of a controlled competitive environment practicing the sport that you're doing, how would you ever be expected to handle the stress of a real life self defense situation? Like, if you can't even handle having a competitive jujitsu role with someone in a controlled environment that's referee. safe with a referee <laughs> and paramedics over there. Like yeah. what if someone does assault you out, you know, like, and how are you going to deal with that? Just a, a little bit of ask yourself that and then Food for thought. go compete. Yeah. Food for thought. Compete. It's important. Do it. All right. On that note, thanks so much for listening. <gasps> Don't forget to take a nervous poo. Don't forget to take a nervous poo. And, uh, yeah, let us know how you go. If you try, if any of these resonated with you or that maybe there's some that you haven't heard of before or if you do implement them in a competition setting, we want to know about it. So let us know. Hit us up at uh, our Instagram, which is beyondjujitsu underscore podcast on Instagram. And if you want to support the show further, we have a Patreon that you can do so. And do we still have rash guards available for order? This comes out Friday next week. It uh, might be the very last yeah. chance. If if you want a Beyond Jiu-Jitsu rash guard, you can see the design on Instagram. It's been up for this pretty much this whole week. Uh, and sorry, last two weeks it's been up. Uh, if you want to order one, this is your last chance to get in. It's a limited run. So if you unfortunately be listening to this in the future, we still hit us up and we'll put you on the list for the next run, but you won't be able to just order whenever. It's specifically made to order uh, for this limited edition run. But on that note, thanks so much for listening. Until next time, guys. Thank See you. you.